Hey, it's Brandon here. Welcome to Transform Your Workplace. Today's episode is brought to you by Zenium HR. Learn more about Zenium's complete HR plus payroll solution at zeniumhr.com. Well, today's episode is a really important one. We are talking about burnout and a lot of people throw around that word burnout. But I think that people are really getting serious about it because the last two years, you know, the, with the global pandemic of COVID-19, it's really put burnout to the forefront. People are stressed out, they're overworked, they're connected to technology in ways that we could have never imagined. And it's all causing burnout and chronic stress. So Jennifer Moss, she's the author of The Burnout Epidemic, The Rise of Chronic Stress and How We Can Fix It. Jennifer's passionate about creating happiness, well-being, and healthy habits in the workplace. There's a lot of great stuff in this episode that you're going to be able to take back to your teams and make sure that you're checking in with your people, making sure that, that they're not experiencing chronic stress and they're not burned out, or even if they are, just to recognize it and then to be able to address it. So I know you're going to get a lot out of this episode. Make sure to connect with me. I'm on LinkedIn and Instagram. I love connecting with listeners there. Enjoy today's episode with Jennifer Moss, the author of The Burnout Epidemic. We'll talk to you next week. Jennifer, it's a pleasure to have you on Transform Your Workplace. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, I'm so glad to be here, Brandon. It's going to be be fun. We've had this word burnout thrown around a lot. Like, what is it? How does it differ from stress and any of the other words that we've used? I, I love that you've asked that question because, you know, I've been sort of shouting from the top of my lungs about burnout for a long time. Like, it's a thing. We better get ready for it. Let's be prepared. And And a lot of what people you know, have sort of um, misunderstood about the term is that like, it's not serious. And it's just kind of whiny millennials saying that they want more work life balance. And we've really tuned people out that are dealing with these major issues. And a lot of people internalize and feel stigmatized and don't then speak up about it. But it's such a serious issue and has such catastrophic consequences that in 2019, the World Health Organization identified burnout as institutional stress left unmanaged. It's occupational phenomena. They added it to their international classification of diseases, their ICD-11, as, you know, essentially a syndrome of chronic stress left untreated. And it shows up in three major signs, high levels of exhaustion and depletion, feeling emotionally distant. Uh, from our job. So we stop feeling like we're adding value. We're not contributing. We're not good at our job. There's a lack of confidence in our job. And the third major sign is cynicism. So we feel hopeless. We feel like we don't have any capacity to change things. And then that leads to symptoms like depression, anxiety. We see increased suicidal ideation and suicide. We see, you know, physical ailments uh, that impact people like stomach and back pain and headaches and migraines. So there's real issues um, and there's an issue around not identifying it, but really labeling it and understanding that it, it's an important topic to consider um, makes it so that more people will talk about it. So it's obviously a problem right now. Has it always been there or is there just more of a, there's a name to it or a, quite frankly, a magnifying glass on it? I think it's both. It's always been there. There's been issues. I mean, one of the root causes of burnout is lack of fairness. I think we've seen wage gaps um, between various groups. I mean, that's just one of the six root causes. So that's you know, one of many examples where it's existed, but the pandemic did, you know, exacerbate all these existing issues. And, you know, when you look at how fast we sped up, it was like it jammed everything into these two years and exploded these issues. I mean, meeting fatigue was a problem before. I mean, meeting fatigue is a major problem now. We've increased our meetings by 252%. So just workload all of these things just sort of got jammed into the last two years and it's led a lot of people to talk about burnout because you can't really ignore it after the pandemic struck. I'm glad you brought up the pandemic because I, I feel like, I don't know what it was about the pandemic, but it 
people were talking about burnout a lot more. And I don't know if it was a result of being isolated or being on the computer all the time, but what do you think it was? Well, I think it was a a bunch of reasons, obviously, like I said, that the rapid speed that everything changed. We even just personally had to kind of accommodate to this new adoption of so many different tools and technologies. And suddenly, I know myself as a mother of three kids, I'm trying to remote teach. And we also thought it was a vacuum of time. So we're sort of making things up as we go for a couple of months. Then there became a vacuum of work because it was an acute situation. It was now a chronic situation. And so that created this sort of um, recipe for disaster. But it also was that there was a lot of attitudes around this being business as usual. And there was still expectations to hit, you know, growth margins. And we were still supposed to hit all those same pre-COVID goals, but then we were adding stretch goals and and people weren't recognizing that this was a massive chronic stressor and that it was making people deal with these other ancillary stressors. Like, well, they were primary stressors, actually work, you know, work was battling with the fact that, that we were grieving a loss, that we were, you know, totally socially isolated from our families and anyone living alone was completely disconnected from everyone else. And so that's happening in this primary environment. And I can say my juggling of work and life was really challenging. I'm writing a book on burnout in the middle of a global pandemic, trying to- As you're homeschooling three children. (laughs) Like the ironies every single day of being, you know, not just a consumer of my book, but writing the book um, was really interesting. So There were aspects that created such an interesting kind of paradigm shifting moment. And the fact that we were trying to juggle that while work was still kind of acting like, oh, no problem, we can figure it out. And our employees are loyal and they're tough and they're resilient. And obviously we see what's happened as a result of that kind of cavalier attitude. Yeah, uh, those are great comments right there. Um, Loyal and everything's fine, but we've had at the same time this is happening where we're talking about burnout, great resignation was happening. Feels like it slowed down a little bit, but do you think the burnout, the whole topic of burnout is largely like contributing to the great resignation that's happening? Well, there's really good data that's supporting that question that you're asking. Microsoft Trends data, they put out a really interesting report in 2021 and just recently in 2022. And they looked at the global workforce and they were trying to figure out why people were resigning, you know, tens of thousands of people across the world. And it used to be in their report that pay was the number one reason why people were leaving. And in this report, it was workload and lack of empathy from their employers. So, you know, that was that these big contributors are playing a role. And the same, you know, the same topic comes up again in their most recent report is, you know, people are leaving. Plus, we're also seeing that people are leaving around 35 to 37% of people that have left are going into no other job. So they're not even, you know, it's not this great reshuffle. Yeah, people have left and just taking time. We're seeing mental health disability claims, the most we've seen in the history of our workplace sort of analysis. And what's so interesting around that is that that's not even capturing then the amount of jobs that have come back or the people that have left. It's really because we're still in, you know, we're still demonstrating that that person has remained with their employer but the amount of people on disability then is just enormous. So there's a lot of data that supports that. It's not just, I want a a better and bigger paycheck. It's I'm exhausted. I've left and I'm not planning to work for a bit. We're seeing huge numbers of teachers and those in healthcare retiring early, um, choosing early retirement. And the number of people that are going into freelance and gig work has really risen as well in those last couple of years. So if we want to get ahead of burnout, we need to recognize what causes it in the first place. What are some of the causes of burnout? Well, according to the WHO, which is based on research by Dr. Christina Maslock, Dr. Michael Leiter there and Susan Jackson. So they've looked at this for a long time. Actually, both of them are retired. They've been in it for about 40 years, came back in the pandemic to do some novel research. I had the fortune of working with them on this because it was so 
you know, profoundly impactful. But they actually have spent a lot of years sort of analyzing this and a lot of data. And the six root causes are overwork. We know this workload. We see it in lack of fairness so that you know, discriminatory behavior. We see it in lack of community. So not having good relationships at work, either to the extreme of being bullied at work, but even just loneliness and exclusion and disconnection leads to burnout. Um, So that's a big one. Values mismatch or even role mismatch. So, you know, that idea of fit, you go into a job, someone's oversold the job, you get in there, you're like, this is not at all what this culture is like a lot of that. Um, We also see it in lack of rewards for effort. So are we being paid properly? That's where the Delta and wage gaps occur, where there's, I'm doing the same work as that other person and I'm not getting paid the same. But there's also the lack of rewards piece. You know, are people being valued? Are they being told that they're good at their job? You know, do they feel like they're contributing? Um, So all of these causes are leading people to feel highly disconnected from work, disengaged from work, which then leads to them kind of over time, it's like micro stressors feeling this feeling every single day. And then over time, it leads to that hitting of the wall, which is when we actually burn out. Have you ever found an industry where this runs more rampant than the others? Absolutely. Healthcare is the Especially most, the last two years. yeah, they were actually, when burnout was, was defined in the seventies, it was based on looking at a group of physicians and healthcare workers and found, and they were working like in New York, sort of in this really at risk neighborhood. And they were serving people that were actually dealing with substance, you know, issues. They're dealing with homelessness and they were dealing with mental health issues. And the researcher said, I think like you guys are mimicking all the sort of signs of the same attributes of the patients we're dealing with and then called it caregiver syndrome at that time. And so we see, and that's been a legacy forever. And that's the same thing when you look at caregiver roles. So teachers have a high rate of burnout. We see this in healthcare professionals for sure. Women are more disproportionately burned out than their male counterparts. We also see this in any vulnerable groups, like women of color were the most hard hit when it came to burnout this year. And those in high production focused environments where there's a lot of high performers because perfectionism is a personality trait that's at risk. So you see this in tech, you know, you see this in finance where there's just this legacy of working so hard. And the only way that you catch that carrot is if you're working these abnormal amount of hours, unsustainable amount of hours. So those are the reasons why those groups are just the most at risk for burnout. When you actually talk to people, working, working people, regular people, what is the reason that they give if they, if they actually are vulnerable, as you said, to saying that they're burned out, stressed, whatever it may be, what reasons do they give why they're feeling that way? A lot of what we've seen in the last few years, for sure, and the leading cause pre-pandemic has been workload, unsustainable workload. Um, Leading cause then major cause now and and after. And it's actually why a lot of people think of overwork as the only reason for burnout and not knowing that there's other five root causes. So it's interesting when eyes kind of light up, okay, well, I actually am dealing with being discriminated against. No wonder I'm feeling burned out. So, you know, these all add up, but often it is unsustainable workloads. And so that's a big reason. And a lot of people say that, but I am hearing through the pandemic, a lot of people just saying lack of empathy for for me and, and thinking like they don't care at all about the fact that I'm juggling all of these other demands and things have changed and they don't care that I'm a, a mother. They don't care that I'm, you know, I just lost a, a family member or multiple family members due to COVID. They don't have any grief policies. There's no paid family leave. All of these things that could be easily policy driven inside of organizations. If, you know, the government isn't going to do the work already, then let's do it inside of our organizations. But that's the kind of thing that we are seeing more of. And a lot of what I heard people say is that when their manager, from being a manager that walks around kind of like, you know, connects, sort of meets up with people by the desk, that when they ended up being remote, all of a sudden they were very micromanaging and they were always kind of checking in and following process and caring more about process. And that has really been a big sign of burnout for people. They're saying like, I just don't know what's going on. I'm, (laughs) I don't know why my boss is like watching me so much right now. That has been an interesting anecdotal piece. 
And then finally, I would say another big one for our younger generation, like sort of older Gen Zs, first in their job, younger millennials, they're saying that it's the disconnection. They feel like they started the job in a pandemic, haven't met their boss, haven't met their coworkers, they have no friendships, then they had to isolate and distance for a long time. They just feel like their career is being atrophied, and that's leading them to feel really burned out. What I'm trying to figure out is, has this always been a problem? Because it seems like we're more willing to talk about it now. Like people are like, I'm burned out. I'm like, I'm overworked. All the reasons you gave. Are we just willing to talk about it now? Because we there's a name to it and we're more vulnerable? Or is this just a product of the last couple of years? And it's just, it's really like picked up and pace as far as like people getting burned out. Like what, what's your take on this? Well, I think that, like I said, burnout, it's like, I've been writing about this. I wrote an article, started writing for Harvard Business Review on the topic of, you know, stress and burnout and and happiness too, around all of these things, you know, over the last decade. And, you know, I wrote this one article and I think it was 2016 or 2017, where I talked about remote workers and burnout, just how they're at risk. And so it's been a, an issue that people have really connected and attached to for a long time. The idea of um, harmonious versus obsessive work mindset. So we can you know, think that we're loving our jobs, but it can also, that passion can lead to burnout. And I wrote that in 2018. So in 2019, I wrote how burnout is about your company, not your people. And it's interesting going back to some of that and seeing like all the things that were real issues then were huge issues in the pandemic. However, I have to say that the pandemic did really, uh, you know, highlight these issues. And the reason why we're talking about it more is because, well, more people are burned out. I mean, we were looking at around 45% of the global workforce pre-pandemic saying they were burned out. Now we're looking at 70 to 90% within certain sectors saying they're burnt out. A recent data point that Abdan Shabal just put out from his company and they partnered with Deloitte said that 72% of C-level executives are burnt out. So even just the high performer, sort of the most protected group of people have all the agency, they're making the money, they're not going to easily get laid off. They have that, you know, job security, all those things that protected them from being at risk of burnout, they're even feeling it. So there has been a shift And a lot of it is the fact that we are tired. We're very tired. It's exhausted. We're dealing with these other socio, you know, economic issues, these geopolitical issues. You know, we have all these other external stressors and then work isn't really changing their dynamic or their expectations based on these these shifts. And so we're starting to see things like big companies like Air Canada, WestJet and other airlines actually reducing their amount of flights, even because not just because, you know, it's good for their business because it's better to have 15 percent more flights going every day, but because they just cannot sustain their workforce. They can't get hired up and staffed up and they also are burning out the people there. Um, So there's a lot of reasons why this economic shift is playing out and it's just exacerbating those existing problems that we talked about. Without burnout being addressed with most employers, what's going to happen? I mean, you already talked about like flights, they're like canceling flights because they're at risk of like losing probably their entire staff. If this is not addressed, what happens? Well, you know, it's interesting. It's a bottom line issue now, like there's an attrition issue. And so it's forced organizations to make changes. And I've, I have seen changes here. I've seen more upstream interventions because I said pre-pandemic and even still, you know, the way that we look at at burnout prevention strategies is all jumbled into wellness. And so we're just giving people ice cream when they need water. And now the whole workforce needs water and anyone just, you know, handing over a lollipop is not going to actually help anyone. So, you know, all of those downstream interventions like self-care, suggestions for self-care and and help with that, like subsidized gym memberships, more yoga, better breathing. Here's an app that'll help you breathe and sleep better. That's great if you're optimized. But what we're seeing now 
is more organizations realizing that it's upstream interventions that need to happen, like care leave, paid family leave, better maternity and paternity leaves, and not even calling it maternity and paternity leaves, because that's very exclusionary language. You know, changing the idea that it's about life on site, instead it's hybrid. Instead of having chefs on site, people are now, Hewlett Packard, for example, is giving people meals to take home to be with their family instead of keeping them on site. So we're more teletherapy, more access to being able to have anonymous supports around mental health, more mental health first aid, you know, that's starting to really take hold. And so that's exciting. That's exciting to me. But then I'm also seeing just recently with this potential recession, a lot of companies kind of being like, ha, 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 now employees won't have any control. So they're going to just have to accept what we give them. So I'm worried that a lot of these changes are not permanent and they're disingenuous. And I'm really trying to advocate to leaders to say it is better for us to have the whole continuum supported of people's mental health experience. And when they're mentally ill, giving them these perks do not help. So knowing that a more well workforce is a more productive, engaged, they, you know, they sell more, they give better shareholder value. So there's reasons for doing that. And it isn't just like, ha ha, we're, you know, we can control our workforce again. That's, I think that's dangerous. How do you recommend leaders come together and make those sort of decisions like you're describing? I mean, to me, it seems like just making sure that the basic needs of people are met because we were describing like perks and all these amazing things we're throwing at employees. But really, when it, when you get to the root of it, we're just wanting our basic needs met. What should employers do? Like leaders come together and what kind of conversations or questions should they be asking? And they need to look at, at the overall, if it is just down to budget and what we're spending, they need to be analyzing and auditing. Like, what are we spending on all those downstream interventions? And if even our high performers who benefited from all of that are the ones that are struggling, then they're not even accessing that too. So kind of look at where you're allocating budget. I say bifurcate between kind of wellness and then burnout prevention, figuring out where the upstream and downstream interventions are. Think more around how, you know, to avoid people from falling in the river versus just pulling them out and treating them downstream. These are the ways that we need to be thinking about it. And when you really think of like where the journey is, we need to talk more about mental illness illness. We need to have more conversations there. We need to understand that a lot of people are not well right now. uh, And it's just, you know, the data is showing that. So leaders need to start small and understand that it doesn't need to be an overhaul. No one has time for an overhaul. It's, you know, when we talk about leaders burning out, having this whole concept of trying to solve for, you know, systemic root issues of burnout might be a little bit daunting. So it's about every sort of uh, direct manager having a lot more power to try interventions that work for them. Maybe it's just a manager within his team, first of all, asking how people are feeling, you know, what are their needs, and then actioning those needs. Maybe it's having better meeting guidelines, reducing the amount of meeting fatigue. Maybe maybe it's auditing your meetings to see how much time theft that people are, you know, taking from each other. Maybe it's right to disconnect. So knowing that you have a certain time at night that you're free from being emailed by anyone, including your clients, and you can use out of office and you're going to be protected from those calls at 11 o'clock at night. It can be very simple shifts. Maybe it's just adding in a non-work related check-in so you can talk to each other about what's going on and it's a safe space and you create psychological safety. I mean, this these are they're tiny micro changes, but you should measure after you do this for a quarter, see, has burnout been reduced? Is job satisfaction improving? How are people just feeling anecdotally about their workload and their feelings about work? And then if it continues to go in that vein and people are happier, then keep doing it. And then advocate to other leaders in your organization to say, hey, I'm doing this really cool thing with my team. I've been asking how they're feeling and then measuring them after. And it's making things better. Morale's better. We're working more productively. And then create this sort of network effect where other leaders buy in because you're doing it, you know, not just as a feel good, but you're doing it with evidence and you're showing that, that it really translates into better, you know, success metrics across the organization. How would you measure this? You talked about measurement. 
a couple times at surveys? Is it just one-on-one conversation? Like, how do you collect this data and make sure that you're actually improving? Well, there's a formalized way that you can do it. Yes, absolutely. You know, the Maslow burnout inventory, I have lots of scales that you can measure and you can do it across the org. It's always good to find out how people are feeling, but it shouldn't be the thing that keeps you from finding out what's going on. And I highly recommend creating you know, anonymized ways of people being able to provide you feedback. Maybe it is just a survey monkey, whatever tool that you can use where you can get people's thoughts in a way that doesn't make them feel like they have to actually speak to you about it. If you have a really good dynamic and that non-work related check-in, if it's done weekly, half an hour every week, consistently and frequently, and you as a manager are being vulnerable and you're sharing, you know, what you're going through, you'll see that you'll start to get more openness. You'll be able to figure out if someone's been saying that they're, you know, and I keep saying a focus on active listening. If someone has said that they haven't slept and every time they come to that check-in and they're like, I had a terrible week of sleep this week, that, and that happens for a month, you know, you should be jumping in there and giving them support tools. Maybe there's, you know, something in the EAP that you can help them with. Like active listening in those meetings are critical skills to develop. And, and empathy is actually very difficult cultural mindset to build, but it can be built. Um, but then again, it can be just here. I'm going to put this one little survey up. There's a million tools that you can use and have people be able to answer it without, you know, identifying information and you'll get some themes in there. You'll, you'll probably hear some things repeated and you're thinking, oh, I never knew that that was the big factor and then action them. Say, you know, what I kept hearing from the themes is that women inside my group are really struggling right now with the, the care or kids coming back or the uncertainty of care. Okay. So let's talk about what we can do as a team to adjust for each other. How can we help and make it about the group, create allies within the group so that we can actually make some, some change where we're all invested in that change. You know, those are the kind of things that we should be, you know, looking for and they're simple, easy to action. And every single week, as we learn more about what's going on with each other, we have to say, what can we do for each other to make next week easier? That should be in that conversation. Everyone should do what they can. And the results, what we've seen across these interventions and watching them unfold has been so fundamentally like life-changing for the leaders that we've talked to. They're like, it is unbelievable how much connection I have with my team because of this. The thing about burnout, nobody's immune to it, even leaders. And what we're describing is helping our employees and checking in with them and giving them what they need. But what about leaders too? Like they're, if they're struggling, how do they take care of their people? Like, what do you recommend as far as taking care of leaders? The sandwiching of leaders between their boss and the expectations that they have, and then, you know, maxing out their team if they say yes, even though they don't really have a choice is a really difficult thing. You see that within direct managers, sort of that layer all the time. And it's, and it's really exhausting for people. And so a lot of what, you know, what I've been saying is that I don't want to be tone deaf and say, oh, just say no to work. That's a privilege that most people don't have. And it's really difficult. It's about really trying to work with your boss to create that relationship as managers with your boss to, to give them a really good purview of what everyone's working on. And so I downstream stream that by asking my, you know, my team, my employees to spend two weeks writing down, like, do, let's do a documentation exercise. It's not going to take really long, but just for the next two weeks, so we can create an advocacy plan around resources and support and reducing burnout. Let's see what everyone's working on. Have everyone just sort of jot down what their priority needs are for the day and how often they actually get them done in the day, how often they have to do them on weekends and evenings. How often does an urgent need that was unexpected just jam out all the other stuff that they've been working on? Has attrition led them to have to wear all these multiple hats? Are they wearing hats that are making them less efficient? You know, are we finding that they're taking on their coworkers' workload because they're gone now and they're not really that strong in that area? They're just doing it because they have to. Um, we also see when we pivoted, a lot of people lack technical training or training within certain areas. They are just sort of expected to learn on the fly. And so they maybe have been doing it this way, this made up way for the last two years. 
make sure that if they could get more training, that maybe they'd be more efficient. Take all that and make sure you're creating an advocacy plan for your boss to say, you want me to add on this project? Well, this is where we're at. This is the picture of where my team is at. And if we don't actually take some front end time to really diagnose where there's inefficiencies and where we could reduce inefficiencies, we're not going to be able to really advocate or we're not really going to be able to solve any problems. So that's it. Reducing inefficiencies, creating a plan to push our leaders to make adjustments when they're asking us just take on more work and making sure that you have the resources to do that. Um, and, and managers are now just being responsible to be hiring managers lately. They're in interview after interview after interview and they're exhausted. So how do we push that you know, around the organization so that they're not just in these meetings constantly? How do we make sure that those people are vetted better, that there's more opportunity to have like a really good understanding of where that person could fit in and narrow that talent down so that manager isn't just like in these unnecessary meetings all day long? There's a lot of tiny tricks and, and ways and tactics that we can reduce workload. And then also at the leadership level, they have to listen better. They have to see what's going on and just recognize that your top talent are about to leave. So if you want to keep them, you better listen to what they're saying. Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Your book is called The Burnout Epidemic, The Rise of Chronic Stress and How We Can Fix It. Any parting thoughts or if you want to point people to a website or any ways to connect with you, that'd be fantastic. I just want to say there's no right way to feel right now. We're still really hungover from the pandemic. Everyone wants to let it go, but we're probably still having a lot of feelings about it. So if you're still feeling all of this, like everything I'm saying is like, check, check, check. You're not alone. Everyone else is feeling that way. So don't feel guilty for your burnout and try to be open about conversations about if you can with other peers and create supports for each other. But if you want to learn more, I write a lot about this on um, blogs and in articles. And so Je jennifer-moss.com is where you'll find all that good information. My guest has been Jennifer Moss. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Appreciate you. Thank you so much, Brandon. It's been a pleasure.